Hi, Saddleback Church. I want to say hello to all our Saddleback family in Berlin, Hong Kong, Santa Rosa, Vancouver, and Buenos Aires. Today is an historic day, not only for Saddleback Church, but for the global church of Jesus Christ, because today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is the birthday of the church. It is celebrated every year, 50 days after Easter Sunday, because that's when it happened in the New Testament. After Jesus was resurrected on Easter Sunday morning, he spent 40 days with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And as part of that instruction, he gave them what we call the Great Commission. It's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Notice he said, go and make disciples and baptize them. So baptism is for disciples. It is for those who have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ. And though baptism is not necessary for salvation, it is necessary for discipleship. I'll say more about that in a minute. But what does this have to do with Pentecost Sunday? Jesus gave his disciples the Great Commission to go and baptize, but then he told them to wait until the Holy Spirit had come. Jesus told them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you're going to receive power like you have never known before to spread my message and to fulfill the Great Commission. And then Jesus was taken up to heaven right before their eyes. Ten days later, the first Pentecost happened. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 2. The passage is too long for your notes, so look here on the screen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, oh, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now think about this. <clears throat> Peter, the man who had denied he even knew Jesus two months earlier, was now filled with power and stood up to preach the message of Jesus to thousands of people. And Peter's message was so powerful, so convicting, so compelling that 3,000 people placed their faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and they immediately were baptized. 3,000 in one day. And the church of Jesus Christ was born. That's what Pentecost is. That's what we celebrate today, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. Just as God, by His Spirit, breathed life into Adam at creation in Genesis 2, God, by His Spirit, breathed life into His church at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And from that moment, the gospel of Jesus Christ swept across the globe and continues to do so 2,000 years later. Now, I want you to notice something. It says 3,000 people accepted Peter's message and were baptized that day. They didn't wait. They didn't go home and think about it. They didn't make any excuses. They didn't have to go through a four-week baptism class. They immediately responded and were baptized. So let me ask you, have you been baptized since you made the decision to follow Jesus? If not, what are you waiting for? We can do this today. Now, let me talk about baptism for a minute because it's a very important part of this message. What is baptism? What does it mean? And why are we commanded to be baptized? First of all, the word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, and it means to fully immerse or place underwater, to submerge. Baptizo is the Greek word that is used to describe a sunken ship. So baptism is not sprinkling or pouring water over someone. Baptism is dipping them completely under the water. Now, I'll get into what baptism represents in a minute, but let me address an important question. Do I have to be baptized to be saved? The answer is no. Salvation comes by grace through faith, not works. Baptism does not save you. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8-9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Bible also tells us that when Jesus was crucified, he said to the thief on the cross next to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Obviously, that thief could not be baptized. And yet Jesus gave him the promise of heaven. So baptism is not required for salvation. However, as I've already said, baptism is required for discipleship. Now, let's consider the command to be baptized. Jesus himself was baptized. We read about it in Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist had been baptizing people in the Jordan River. One day, Jesus came to John and told him to baptize him. Picking up at, at verse 13, the Bible says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. 
as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, there are a few things I want to point out here. First of all, Jesus himself was baptized. He was fully immersed. Verse 16 says, he came up out of the water. Well, that means he had been under the water. So we baptize the way Jesus was baptized, by full immersion. But even more important is that immediately after he was baptized, the Bible says heaven was split open. The Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove, and the Father spoke. He said, this is my son. I love him and I am proud of him. And from that point on, Jesus started his ministry. Jesus stepped out of the water and into his ministry. He stepped out of the water and into his divine purpose. He stepped out of the water and into the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was showing us, showing us something. At baptism, because of the Holy Spirit, heaven is open to you, and the favor and power of God rests on you. There is an access, an, an openness, an availability to heavenly resources of wisdom and power to accomplish the tasks ahead of you wisdom and power to endure whatever hardship you're facing, and wisdom and power to influence the world around you for Jesus Christ. And that is available to you after baptism. Because of Jesus, we can walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you can walk in the affirmation of your heavenly Father that you are my son, you are my daughter. I love you, and I'm proud to be your father. When you follow Jesus into the waters of baptism, something of the Holy Spirit's divine power is made available to you, and you begin to step into the purpose God has intended for you. Baptism is not an empty religious ritual. It is a powerful spiritual act of faith and obedience, and it has enormous implications for your life. We baptize because Jesus commanded it and Jesus modeled it. If you want to follow Jesus, you must follow him into the waters of baptism. If you have not been baptized, then you cannot live a fully surrendered life. While baptism is not necessary for salvation, it is necessary for living the Christian life as a fully surrendered disciple of Jesus Christ. Why? Because surrender requires obedience to Jesus, and Jesus commanded us to be baptized. He demonstrated it, and he commanded it. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So let me ask you, do you love him? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, we show our love for God by obeying his commandments, and they are not hard to follow. Getting baptized is not difficult. It's just a matter of you saying, yes, Lord, I will do what you told me to do, and then do it. You might ask, well, I was baptized as a baby. Isn't that enough? Do I have to be baptized again? Well, let me ask you, did you love Jesus when you were a baby? The decision to baptize you as a baby was not your decision. It was not your act of faith and obedience. It was your parents' decision because they loved you and they wanted what's best for you. But your parents' faith cannot save you. Following Jesus has to be your decision. Salvation is your decision, and baptism must follow that decision. You are not saved because you were baptized. 
you get baptized because you are saved. Remember, Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent and be baptized. So baptism follows repentance. The action follows the decision. And you were not able to make that decision when you were a baby. Jesus himself was presented in the temple as a baby by his, his parents. But he made his own decision to be baptized as an adult. He was showing us something. Baptism needs to follow my conscious decision to place my faith in Christ. If you have decided to place your faith in Jesus and to trust him for your salvation, then your next step is to be baptized as a public statement of your faith. So, what does baptism mean? I want you to write this down. Baptism is a symbol of Jesus' death and resurrection. It is a symbol of Jesus' death and resurrection. When you are baptized, you are saying, I believe in Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. The Bible says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You see, baptism isn't just something to check off of your spiritual to-do list. Baptism is a statement of faith. In fact, I want you to write this down. Baptism is not a box I check. It is a mark on my life. Baptism is a life statement that you are a marked man. You are a marked woman. When you come out of the water, you're not saying, I was baptized. You're saying, I am a baptized follower of Jesus Christ. I live in covenant relationship with Christ. Baptism is my way of saying I am a part of his family, the global church of Jesus Christ. My life is fully surrendered to him. I am a new covenant person. We often use the analogy of a wedding ring when we talk about baptism. I wear this ring as a symbol of a lifelong committed relationship. I made a covenant with my wife, Linda, 40 years ago. And I wear this ring as a reminder of that covenant. It is a statement to Linda and to the world that I belong to her as her husband. Now, this ring does not make me a husband, but it symbolizes that I am a husband. It's an outward symbol of an inward truth. So the question is, am I living like a married man? Am I living like I am in a covenant relationship with my wife? In the same way, baptism does not make you a Christian, but it symbolizes that you are in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. It's an outward symbol of an inward truth. Your baptism is a statement to the church and to the world that you belong to Christ and he belongs to you. And it is also a symbol to the church that you are a part of the family of God. So the question is, am I living a baptized life? Does my life reflect my covenant relationship with Christ? And that's why I said baptism is not a box that you check. It's a mark on your life. I want you to write this down. Baptism is not only a symbol of leaving an old life, it is also an entry into a new life. You're not just leaving your old life behind, you are entering a new dimension of life in Christ. And that new life is available to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 
Baptism not only represents a cleansing from past sins, it now symbolizes the truth that we are dead to sin. The Bible says we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In other words, those of us who are baptized into Christ are baptized into his death and resurrection. That's why when we baptize people, we put them under the water and we say, buried with him in baptism, and then we hold them there for three days. Just kidding. And then when we bring them out of the water, we say, and raised to walk in newness of life buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Now get this. Raised to walk in newness of life does not mean to start the old life over. It means you have entered into a whole new kind of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is spirit-empowered kingdom life with a new set of values, a new way of thinking, a new identity, new vision, new hope and a new destiny. Following Jesus is a process. It is a lifelong journey of discipleship. Now you might be asking, when can I be baptized? And I am so glad you asked that question. You can be baptized right now at the end of this service. You don't need to wait any longer. Let's do this today. In Acts chapter eight, we read about a disciple named Philip who was riding in a carriage with an official from Ethiopia and telling him the news of Jesus' death and resurrection. The man heard Philip's message and believed. And the Bible says, look here on the screen, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. The official said to Philip, look, there's some water. What can keep me from being baptized? The official ordered the carriage to stop he and Philip stepped into the water, and Philip baptized him. Philip didn't make him wait. He didn't make him stand before a committee or make a public speech. Philip baptized him instantly, just like Peter and the disciples baptized those 3,000 new believers on the day of Pentecost. So we do things that way too at Saddleback Church. Several years ago, when I was teaching at a night of worship here in Lake Forest, I invited people to come and be baptized at the end of my message. After a few minutes, a young man named Miguel joined me in the water. He was very emotional, weeping, and could hardly talk at all. So I asked him, Miguel, when did you give your life to Jesus Christ? And he replied through tears, right now, right now. That was the moment that Miguel was born again. So I led him in a prayer to open his heart to Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord, and then I baptized him. I didn't make him wait. I didn't tell him to go read some Bible verses and take some classes and come back another day. I baptized him right then and there, just like Philip baptized the man from Ethiopia. I baptized Miguel into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he came out of the water a new man. Listen, friend, you do not have to wait any longer. If you believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you can be baptized today, right now, right here on this Pentecost Sunday. You can be one of thousands of believers all over the world who are being baptized today and saying, as the Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or perhaps you've already been baptized, but you've wandered away from faith, and today 
you want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. Just like people renew their wedding vows, you can renew your relationship with Jesus and be baptized again today. There is nothing in the Bible that says you cannot be baptized more than once. So come. We have everything you need to be baptized. A pool of water, shorts, t-shirts, towels. The only thing missing is you. So come. Don't wait any longer. Take this step of faith. Take this step of obedience. Take this step of love. We want to celebrate with you. After I pray, your campus pastor will show you where to go for baptism at your campus. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the birth of your church. Thank you that we can be a part of your family here on earth. Lord, would you bless your church today with power to be your witnesses everywhere we go. And we thank you for the privilege of baptism. For those of us who have been baptized since we placed our faith in you, help us to live as baptized people, walking in obedience to your word, growing in our faith, living lives that please you. And for those of us who have not yet been baptized since we made the decision to follow you, I pray that you will speak deeply into our hearts right now and give us the courage to take this important step of obedience and faith. And if you have never opened your life to Jesus Christ, if you want to start your personal relationship with him today and receive forgiveness of your sins, then in the quiet of your heart, just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins so that I can be forgiven. Thank you for rising from the dead so that I can have the promise of eternal life with you in heaven. I open my heart to you right now and receive you as my Savior and Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.